talking about moorland, mallee and heathlands. Um, and I've put down um, a list of people. <laughs> a list of people that uh, have been associated with working in the moorlands, mallee and heathlands. But Richard's complaining he's not down on the list. <laughs> so I hope I haven't missed anybody else. The first work was um, done in Moorland by John Marsden Smedley in the 90s. Um, and the moorlands are sort of crossed between grass and, heath and shrublands. When they're older, um, they tend to be more of a tussock form, but when they're younger, they look more like grass. And there's a fair amount of moorlands in Tasmania. So the idea was to completely um, characterise the, the system for predicting fire behaviour in moorlands to develop models for fuel characteristics, fire behaviour, conditions for extinction, to predict dead fuel moisture content and develop a fire danger rating. So there would have been about 50 fires, would it be John? 150 fires um, that John did. Um, they're on, um, they have 50 metre ignition um, widths, which is something we um, I'll talk about in a minute. The fires in the moorland basically um, they're almost crown fires. They can they can burn over standing water. The variables in the spread equation were wind speed, dead fuel moisture content and fuel age. And age was used because it was easier for managers. It tends to be a surrogate for, both, for loading, for percent dead and bulk density. So as the um, fuel gets older, it's get, there's, there's uh, more loading, there's more percent dead and there's less bulk density. So all those factors can probably contribute to the rate of spread. But putting age in makes it easier for, uh, for it to be used, the model to be used. So that's uh, a picture of the, um, the, wind, the rate of spread against the wind speed for several ages. And my point here about the ignition line length was the experimental data actually for, um, fitted a straight line. But we made a curve to, um, to fit some wildfire data that was right up this end. So in view of um, what Phil found with ignition line length, I think we probably ought to go back and re-examine that. Because some of the, most of John's fires will not have achieved the potential rate of spread. The change with age lessens as, the, um, as we get older. The moisture content effect is there from 5% here to 20% moisture content here, but it's less of an effect than is found either in the grassland or the, uh, or the forest. Most of that effect was coming from some very wet, wet fires. So John developed a moorland fire danger rating system, which basically depended on spread rate and flame height. And I believe that's still being used in Tasmania today. John did a lot of burning for smaller fires, test fires for go, no go. And we um, linked the um, go, no go to wind speed and moisture content lo using logistic regression. But what it looks like diagrammatically is that if the moisture content is less than about 25%, every fire will go. As the moisture content gets up, it will only go if there's enough wind speed. And for higher moisture contents, it won't go at all. So the, the, the use of this go-no-go no go was for unbounded burning 
where you're burning without any, um, fire, any barriers and you hope that the uh, wind speed will die down and the moisture content will increase at, in the evening. Turning to Mali Heath, um, what we've done just recently is to combine two sets of data. The first data from Lockie McCaw in 98, who was burning in the Mali in Western Australia. And this is an example of, of one of the fires in the Mali, in the Stirling Ranges. And the other lot of data, much more recently, is from Narcat Conservation Park in South Australia. Now, both Lockie and Miguel develop models separately for their burns, but what we've done is to combine the data. The um, <coughs> South Australian fires were burnt in seven-year-olds, 20-year-old and 48-year-old Mali, and you can see that the structure is very different. <coughs> the seven-year-old looks more like a heathland. The 20-year-old, it's getting the mully is getting taller and the uh, underneath is fairly sparse. And that's an example from the paper we've just published of <coughs> the different sorts of fire you get in the uh, different mully under different conditions. So <coughs> you've got a very discontinuous mully here with not much wind speed. You just get a break up of the flame front. Marginal propagation in the litter. As the wind gets up, you're getting a moderate intensity, fast spreading fire and, a high, and <clears throat> turning to a high intensity crown fire. So <clears throat> we modeled the probability of spread, the rate of spread, the probability of crowning and the crown fire rate of spread. In all these, wind speed is important, probably the most important. Litter fuel moisture content appears in the probability of spread, the rate of spread and the crown fire rate of spread, but it doesn't appear in the probability of crowning. <coughs> and then the fuel comes in as surface fuel continuity and the probability of spread an overstory cover in the crown fire rate of spread. The height comes in in the rate of spread, but only as a wind reduction factor. So if you use the two metre wind speed, you don't need height in the rate of spread. But if you use the 10 metre wind, you need the height to get the wind reduction. So that was the, um, the data the observed rate of spread against the predicted rate of spread, and it's a pretty good fit compared with a lot of data sets. Um, you can see I've split it up into uh, the South Australian ones with dark points and the Western Australian ones with light points, and they pretty well <coughs> fall on top of each other. If you fix the, uh, the fuel um, and you fix the moisture content, you plot the probability of a sustaining of sustained fire spread against the wind speed, the fire sustainability starting at zero, the probability of fire um, sustainability. Um, by the time you get to 40 kilometres an hour, you are almost certainly to get fire spread. The crown fire propagation sort of takes off at 20 kilometres an hour and then is much steeper, going up to 40. And the rate of spread, going from no propagation at all to surface rate of spread, and then an intermittent rate of an intermittent crowning, um, and then turn to the crowning phase. So this surface phase is modelled and the crown phase is modelled. And between the two of them, we've just sort of basically joined them together. So it looks a bit like the thing that Mike Watton was showing you um, this morning on uh, the, the um, Canadian model.
Turning to Heathland, this is more of a problem. There's a lot of different bits of Heathland in Australia, but they're all, they're all very different in structure. And there's very small opportunity to burn, to do large scale experiments. Nobody will let us burn all their heathland. <laughs> so, just to give you an idea, the coastal heathland, the temperate wet heathland down in East Gippsland, Montane heathland, Hawkesbury sandstone, they're all very different in structure. That's actually turning more of a woodland. So, in 1998, a group of us got together um, from different organisations, and at the time we had 70 experimental fires and 16 wildfires, with a maximum rate of spread of 74 metres per minute, an intensity of 90,000 kilowatts per, per metre. We had a workshop down at Marimbula to <laughs> to check we were all using the same methodology. <laughs> we came up with a model that was basically linear, almost linear in, in wind speed. And the, the other variable in the model was the height of the fuel. So the height of the fuel was to the power a half approximately. But there was no moisture effect. <coughs> at all. Could, we couldn't find any moisture effect in the um, regression model. And that was partly because we didn't have any uh, fuel moistures less than 10% in the data. So what the model looked like, the rate of spread increased with wind speed almost linearly. And if you went from one metre to to four metres, you, um, the rate of spread was multiplied by two. And the model fitted quite nicely. Um, and that's the model that's probably in people's spreadsheets that go to the fire behaviour analyst course. But it was always a niggle that there wasn't any moisture content effect in it. So recently, um, we've got more data from Spain in particular, um, and more, there has been some more published data from various places in the world. We've tried to include more data. We have now got a moisture content effect um, here. It's more or less the same linear in wind speed and height to the, to the half, but there's a moisture content effect that isn't as strong as that in grass or um, in forest, but there is an effect there. And it's come mostly from the, um, the Spanish data, the Spanish laws. So I'm a little happier about that. The fit, of course, isn't so good. There's more data. But that's about the best we can do. Um, these are down by people's names. This is the New Zealand data, the, um, the Spanish data, the data from um, Miguel from um, NARCAT, Van, Van Wilgens, Brian Van Wilgens, Fine Boss, and this is Rod, Bradstock, Hawkesbury, Sandstone. This data here from John and John Larson Smedley and from Greg McCarthy are actually haven't been used to do the model, but they've been um, fitted to the model. So that gives us a little bit more confidence. I haven't got um, any wildfire data here. That's a process we've got to do with validation. And I'm asking everybody to dig into their filing cabinets and see if they can find any validation data. Because what we want to do next year is to put this together, make it a paper, and finish it off. Those two points there, um, they, were very, um, they were very low heath, 
of um, Miguel's and they were going like, they were ripping along. And we really don't know um, what this is caused by. If we look at the bulk density model, those are the same two points. I've used here uh, bulk density instead of height. And there's not so much data because not everybody's measured load. So these are the same two points here. And it looks like the bulk density effect is explaining them better than the height effect. But I can't see that people are going to be able to measure bulk density in the field. So I think we, what we will do, we'll come up with two models, one with, one with height and one of sort of for management and a scientific model which tries to explain what's going on. For woodlands, and it's some data I haven't got here that Nick Gelly gave me a long time ago, it looks like that if you use a wind reduction factor, um, the woodlands fit pretty well. Um, the work, the only work, stuff that I know that's been done in, in woodlands for wind reduction came from Kung Tran in Tasmania a while ago. So if anybody knows any more, um, it will be useful in uh, woody um, woodlands with a heath understory. Turning to slope, um, Project Fuse as part of the CRC um, did some burns on slopes in, uh, in New Zealand. They see one of the fires burning up the slopes. Um, I'm sorry to say that so far we can't make sense of the data. <laughs> and I think this is probably because um, there are several factors in play, like the, the, ignition, the, the size of the head fire, the effect of the wind on, on the, the slope on the wind, um, and the slope, or the slope effect are all interacting. It looked to me like in the beginning when we had data for some years ago, that the slope effect wasn't as big as the slope effect in, in litter fuels, possibly because there's more buoyancy. But I just don't think that at the present time we can um, say anything about slope. And it's probably better um, if you push to use the uh, MacArthur slope effect. And then it, you, you'll overestimate, not underestimate. That's um, just put in, it's a slide of Miguel's um, to show the relative effects, rates of spread with wind speed in grassland, in Mali, in heath, and in forests. And that's it.